I'm Anthony Gethers. And I'm Greg Weiss. And, and we, we are, are the hosts of Case for Bass. Hey, this is Doug Pinnick, and you're watching Case for Bass. May the groove be with y'all. With the famous Doug Pinnock from King's X solo projects and a bunch of other projects that we won't even bother mentioning. It's going to go right at the base. So, Doug, welcome to the show, number one. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. Let's talk about your history. First right. and foremost, did the base find you or did you find the base? And tell me it when found, you it. It found me. I was. The song called Why Do Fools Fall in Love? came on the record player. It was an old 78 on the G label, and I was like 9 or 10, maybe younger, I'm not sure. And I remember it was at my cousin's house, and I was sitting on the couch, and she had just brought three new records home, uh, The Platters You Send Me and something else. And she put the record on, and I remember the bass line to this day, and I just all out this bass and I was just like wow and I sat there listening to it and from that day on everything I listened to I listened to the bass first everything else was secondary for most of my life until I started playing in a band and started writing music realizing that there were other instruments to focus on you know I mean literally I didn't even pay attention to anything else. It was just, it, it had to be loud bass. My friends used to say that when they come to my house or ride in my car, they said, all you heard was bass coming out of the stereo. You didn't, mm. I would turn the treble off almost. And you just, you wouldn't even know what the song was, people told me. Wow. I knew what it was, cause I, yeah. I'm used to listening to it that low, but yeah, right. I was pretty obsessed. Even when I bought my first bass amp, I used to play it in my, my bedroom when I lived with my mom and the walls rattled and um, the, the, the door hinges started to loosen up by the time I moved. Uh, but, yeah, that's awesome. by, the time I, by the time I moved away, yeah, my mom says, you turn it off when I get home from work. When I'm gone, you can do whatever you want to. When she leave for work, it was wide open with my window open in the projects, playing along the line of family stone and shit. Wow. That's awesome. What was your mm -hmm. first what was your first bass that you bought? And tell me why you purchased that instrument in particular and how did it feel to you when you first grabbed onto it? Well, I, I, let me give you a little ghetto mentality from where I was coming from. Being poor, you know, never have any money, not thinking you can get anywhere. Um, I used to just talk about it. I want to play bass. I talked about it with friends to neighbors anybody i just always talked about bass and one day this guy says well, why don't you buy one and i and it unbelievably hit me and thought oh and i'm going well i didn't know where to buy one at because i never really there's no music store in the town i grew up in i didn't know in fact i really didn't you know there was not much tv so i barely knew what a bass looked like mm, even. Okay. and uh um so i'm just really ignorant of all of this but I kept dreaming about playing bass and talking about it. And so my best friend, it was right, up, right after we got out of high school. He um, um, actually a little bit longer than that, actually, because I was 23 when I started playing bass. So I was around 23 and my friend said to me, uh, I'm buying a bass for my girlfriend for Christmas. You want to hang on to it for a while and plunk around since you want to play bass. Because uh -huh. I figured I was one of those people that I was just wasn't ever going to get one. Mm -hmm. You know, I just didn't know how to do it, what to do. I didn't think about it. It was like, literally, I was kind of a space cadet when I was growing up. I really, really didn't think about how to do things. I just wanted to, and I dreamed. But anyway, so we brought the bass over, started, and I started plunking on it. And I remember I put on Buddy Miles, uh, Joe Tex. Do, 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 do. Yep. And, I, and I remember I picked up the bass and being left-handed, I knew that I'm supposed to play 
the other way. I picked the bass up and picked it up left-handed and, and learned how to go gung, 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 uh, uh, and, and it just, it was a struggle. But when I played the riff, first primitive time, I jumped up off the, my seat and started screaming and yelling. I was so excited that I was playing bass. Literally, it. Wow. it was it was like That's an awesome. orgasm. That's awesome. And, yeah. and then I sat down and started learning. And from that moment, I don't remember learning how to play bass or struggling to play it or fighting to play it or being frustrated. I just played it and played it i didn't care i didn't think i was good or bad i was just playing That's and beautiful. and everything that came on the record player you know i i tried to play uh and then after that i didn't have a still didn't have an amp and i had a record player though so what i would do is i would take my headphones and take one side of the the turntable and plug it into one side of the the this the record player or the 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 power amp and on the other on the the, the right side, I would put the bass into it on my little record player. I mean, my stereo mm -hmm. it, with that had the record player on. You know what I'm talking about. If, you, if yes. you're old school. Yeah, of course. Okay. Oh, and yes. So, and so bass was on this side and the music was on this side. And I did that for hours and hours listening to bass on this and music on that. And it became just what it was until one day um, uh, 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 I I actually started a band with my cousin because nobody let me play bass with him because I wasn't good enough. Mm. I'd say, let me play bass with you. They go, no, you can sing, but you can't play bass. Mm. And I, you, and you were so driven, though. I mean, I was so was, driven. You were driven. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. nothing got in your way. Nothing. The technology didn't get in your way. Right. The, you know, the equipment yeah. didn't get in your way. Mm -hmm. And but you knew, mm -hmm. you knew that that bass, this dream yeah. you had, was was going to keep you pushing. Awesome. Right. Even even my pastor said you shouldn't be playing bass. God can't use rock and roll. And I just looked, I just looked at him. I said, okay. And I just kept on playing. Wow. <laughs> so That's great. It just didn't fucking matter. <laughs> well, let me ask That's you this. Beautiful. You grew up now. You said you mentioned that you grew up in the ghetto. When were you exposed to playing rock? Because look, at the end of the day, if you think about most bass players, especially rock players, a yes. lot of them will play with a pick. So mm -hmm. traditionally. Did you start off with playing with the No, fingers no, I, I, I didn't. I started with my fingers, Jamie Jameson, you know, and that kind of stuff. But the thing was... Like, I you were about, when, you said Jamie when, Jameson. Yeah, when, when, anytime you mention it, <laughs> we, 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 we always bow. Well, we we'll, bow see, we'll see Jamie and Willie Weeks and um uh just all the, the old time bass players uh donald duck dunn all those yeah. guys oh, had no. played we well, see, another one. Yeah, duck duck duck. yeah. Really see, I, see i was a teenager when all that was happening and so i'm listening to the radio with to every bass line you know so so when i hung bass it would sound like those guys in my head i'd make the bass lines up like they did um but but what happened was i don't even know if i was playing bass at this time yet but it was still in my head. Like I said, I would walk around the house humming bass lines and playing like I was playing bass with a boom. I did that for years. Mm. And um, so um, I remember I'm into all this and this uh, uh, guy came over to my house. I started, um, let me make something real real quick here. I grew up in a, almost an all white town. I was the only black kid in the school till I, uh, I was 14. Then I moved into another town with my, uh, and moved in with my mother and the rest of her children. And it was a town that was like a fourth black. So I learned more about being, but we were still poor, both sides. So so what I'm saying is now is like, I'm out of high school, I'm 22, um, out on my own, and, I'm, and I've moved back in with my mom and in the projects, okay? And and uh, so, the what was I gonna say about the bass though? Um, oh, this white guy, I have to say that because the black community, we always have to make that distinction. This white boy came over with Led Zeppelin and said, here, listen to this. And he, he, used to, he would pick me up to go to college. I went to college for a couple semesters. And he would pick me up and he brought this record by and he says, dude, check this out. And it's Zeppelin 2. And and Zeppelin I, too. Uh huh. Oh, and yeah. I, and oh, but if you were a bow, oh yep, yeah, I, it does I, get a bow. Bow yes. and a wave. Yep. <laughs> so I so I put it on, and what I heard was, and you know, and what I heard in my head was Booker T and the MGs without keyboards. Yes. 
Wow. And I was in. I wasn't crazy about Robert Plant singing. He wasn't soulful enough to me. I, I didn't understand at the time. This is a whole new thing was happening. And now I've learned to, to appreciate all of that. But, um, but what I heard was it was basically soul music on 12. Here I am in my early 20s. What teenager, what guy in the early 20s wants to reinterpret what somebody else has done harder? You know what I'm saying? It was like these guys are taking all the shit that I've been listening to my whole life and, and turning it on 12. And I related to it because I was their age. Mm, I mean, they they did. Did. Even, even Jumbo Jones was talking about that, about right. how... He was capturing those tones and those sounds because right. that's that's what was going on. Was going on exactly. Yep. I mean, and John Bonham. I mean, God put on Sly and Family Stone, and you can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. They they played so much alike. The licks, the riffs. Sit down and listen, and you just go, "Oh my God, that's where he got all that stuff from." And John put his twist on it and did his thing. He Don't did. get me wrong. Yep. Don't fucking get me wrong, but but he even said that that Gregorico was his, you know, his the guy that he wanted to play like. So you mm. can hear it. It's 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 a beautiful combination when you get the picture and, and listen. Go back and listen to that stuff sometime. Okay, when did you make the transition? Because now you're, oh, from, you, you're from in, pick from pick to fingers. Yeah, from yes, fingers to pick. Yes, I'm playing with my fingers, and um. This I I put on this record called Yes by Yes called Roundabout. Okay. Oh, and I, God. And, and and I heard this clunk clunk clunk. Da, 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 da. I'm going, what is that? And I thought that reminds me of a clavinet, because when oh, I first heard Steve, oh, okay. when I first heard Stevie Wonder and um uh um Billy Preston, they did the clavinet thing, and I'm all into that tone. Mm -hmm. The other thing I've always loved. Aside from bass, was a bass piano. The low notes, how they the low clank. notes and piano. Yes, when you that was a tone that I it was I gravitated to. And the other thing was baritone saxophone, which I played in grade school. You know what's funny uh, that you mentioned that baritone saxophone. Mm -hmm. And sorry to interrupt you. We're meeting mm -hmm. a lot of bass players who have the baritone saxophone connection. Yes, really, really because in that sense. Well, think think about American bandstand. Do -do 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 -do. Yeah, and and so when I'm playing bass, you know that's why I swing because mm. it's I'm playing I'm playing you know uh, uh, saxophone riffs. You know, mm. I mean that's what I hear in my head a lot of times. Mm. But back to Chris Squire, the pick when I, when I heard that I didn't know what to do, and so I saw a local band play, and this guy told me he was in he was looking for that sound too. Because he played with his fingers, and it was a guy in a local band that I would always go see, and just talk to him about bass, because because I had just started playing. And one day I went to see him play, and he was clanging like a motherfucker. I'm serious. <laughs> I mean, and uh, and, uh, and he was playing with his fingers. And after the set, I walk, I go up. There's like 30 people in the club. You know, it's just a little local nothing. Then I go up and go. So how did you get that sound? He goes, dude. He took, he said he took some those fingers picking things that you use on a, on a, uh, a, a banjo acoustic guitar. A yeah, a banjo. Guitar. Yep. And he turned them around backwards. Oh, that's crazy. Wow. And played it. And so I went and bought some of those first. And I did that for wow. like okay. five, five minutes. But, but then somebody told me that if you use a pick, it's just that much easier. And so I got a pick and I went, and I go, well, there it is. But I still couldn't get the clang. The clang, mm. hap the clang happened a couple years later when I was in Florida and I went to jam with a band and they had a trainer amp and it was a YB3100. Okay. And those those things I have nothing but crystal high end. Just all clang. high ends. Yeah. yeah. Nothing but and I plugged into that thing and I went, there it is. And I traded him my two bass cabinets for that head. Because I wanted uh, it so bad, then I had to figure out how to get another bass cabinet. Wow, that's you, awesome! She traded that 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 that's bass cabinet. That's awesome. Just to get I look, yeah, I, I, I had these two amp, these I had these two Ampeg, eighteen inch cabinets. Those little ones. Yep. Yeah. That the, that the top opens up, and there was a power amp in one of them. Whoa. Really vintage. Somebody wow. gave it to me. It was in their garage, and their had their dad had it back in the. 50s and he gave it to me because i didn't have remember i didn't have a job 
Okay. I, I hardly ever work. It's like I just forge my way somehow and, and, and got all this. But then I still don't know how. And I, I thank the universe. Nice. But uh, yeah, so um, so I didn't know the value of it or anything. I should have told him I'll give you one this one cabinet with the amp in it. And, you know, if I was thinking, but I didn't care. I wanted that amp so bad. I just was, there was no second thought. Wow. And uh, so, yeah, and then, then it was too bright. Yeah. And so I luckily I don't know how I got this, but I was look I had to find another bass cabinet and somebody gave me an old acoustic eighteen Ooh. folded horn. Okay. Okay. Wow. So I, I plugged that trainer in the folded and it had there was low end because the those the folded cabinets give you a little bit more bottom. Yes. And it and it buried the high end a little bit and it gave it that gravelly rattle like that that i'm used to and basically those two things are what from that point on is what i've tried to create probably till now you know even my pedal it sounds like that wow can i can i ask you a question doug yes yes because you you were there when I'm, i'll use the term fred flintstone bass like oh, yeah. when 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 there was no low end cabinets there was no mm -hmm. frequency generation of right. these e and a strings even the bass players were using guitar amps right and so you, you you're like one of the guys who was there when all this stuff changed when ampeg started making an svt when they put out an eight speaker cabinet and and how did that open you up i specifically remember playing through a svt I could not believe that my wildest dreams had come true. Wow. That I, the low end was underneath me. It was warm. It was big. Yeah. Never, I never heard amp sound like that. Those I was hooked. can give you back massages. Dude, I, I had eight of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, back, back in the Dogman day, I had eight of them, and they all were on. Every wow. one of them. That's they, cool. Every, all, and I had uh, three... 1,000 watt crown power amps running them. That's and pure. Was, That's no EQ. It, it, That's, it, it, it that was straight crushing. up. Oh, and th but th then I put the guitar amp in the preamp and then just ran them together. And so, but yeah, it was, um, it was ridiculously loud. Um, you know, coming from the seventies, that's kind of what we did. Uh -huh. So I just, I, I, I just thought I took it, take it as far as I could, you know. <laughs> but the, the, the technology was changing where it was never there before. The bass wasn't even making it on records. No. Right, right. You were just getting like percussive thuds and thumps. And then, exactly. you know, when, when, when you heard that Zeppelin album, you know, you're just like, wait a second, there's something going on mm -hmm. that's, that it's this thing that it, it's unexplored. It's, it's this whole new direction. <laughs> to be in a band. Yep. Now I noticed that you play sh a lot of Schecter bases. I'm assuming that by now you're endorsed by them. Yeah. Oh, that's why I play them. Okay. So now let's talk about Schecter, the tone, how it, the bass makes you feel when you play it. Cause obviously you mentioned with the Ampegs, mm -hmm. you feel mm -hmm. the warmth of the mm -hmm. instrument. Does that, does the Schecter bass give you that connection? Like when you're playing, um, you know, I don't know. It's it's the weirdest thing about playing bass for me is um how do I explain that? Cuz I've got several different bases from I've I've endorsed like I think four or five companies through my through my lifetime of playing bass and um each company the base that they gave me was like to die for, you know, it was mm. like, it was everything I want. And and so I'm sitting here at home working on new songs or something. I'll look over in my green Yamaha right here. I'll pick it up and I'll go, Oh yeah, I remember this. And there's just something about it, but then I'll put it down and then pick up my Schecter, you know, and I'll go, Oh yeah, this is, you know, it's sort of like you talk to you. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's sort of like wearing a different, you know, some days you feel like wearing tennis shoes and some days you feel like putting boots on, you yeah, know, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's, that's how it is with me for bass, bass guitars. Uh, yeah, it really is. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Can you, you talk know, about, it's, I'm it's, sorry, for, could you, uh, go, go, ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, oh I was just going to say a lot of, a lot of times too, is I don't take care of them. So the next would be 
kind of warped or the strings would be really too high and all that stuff. And, and you know, and it's just like, I just keep playing. It's just, it doesn't matter. I always think, oh, I need to fix this or this buzz is happening, but I'll just keep on going. If my oh, tech, okay. when I go on the road, sometimes my tech will go, Doug, you know, you need to, I go, would you do here? Take it. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll give it back to me and go, oh, wow, this is so much more easy. You know, there's this French company that gave me this uh, bass, oh, about 20 years ago now. It's probably one of my favorite basses ever. It's a go-to bass with the tonality, feel, everything about it. it. It's built like a Fender P bass, but it's it's got that Gibson perfect thing where the strings are, you know, I mean, it's it's just, it's and it's kind of a high dollar bass, but this company, a boutique company gave me uh, one of these basses just because we played in uh, France and he was a fan and bless his heart to this day, it's probably when I'm struggling with bass in a studio with anything, Mm-hmm. I just go, go get that one, you know, and I'll go put it That's on. That's awesome. And, and all of a sudden, everything's there, that the, every note is heard, you know, and, and you know, and it's kind of, it's heavy like a Fender P bass, a little heavier. So I sit down with it, and, and I'm more accurate when I sit down, when I'm standing up, I'm swinging around, and just, I'm all over the place. But being accurate and sitting down, it's just, I realize every time, this is such a nice bass. And it's got like a couple different tones to it where you can dial it in to exactly what you need. Because on all my basses, I just have a tone control. Okay wide open that's it you just leave it yeah. wide open mm-hmm. so this is a real kind of bass that the conventional people would would, would play mm-hmm. <laughs> and it comes in handy when it's needed it, we we hear that a lot so we, other players call it the tool for the job mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and and they have other bases but they they sometimes have this multi-versatile bass yeah that 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 can get i we were we were talking to somebody here this thing had like 20 different settings on it for every uh-huh. different kind of fender ever made from every okay. year but what i wanted to ask you was i've been listening to a lot of your solo stuff oh, and good. what i really like about what you're doing is is how you lay this heavy groove and your vocal harmonies you're harmonizing with yourself yep and 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 you're coming across but what really struck me was that 12 string you're playing oh my god <laughs> yes that 12 string is and nuts. and if you could talk about that because not a lot of people ever get to play a 12 string mm. but i mean you're playing with it you're recording with it uh, and 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 it has so much depth in the note because it, you you're out guitaring your guitar player and, yeah. and 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 well but it's a it's thing true. because because we're bass guitar yeah. and uh-huh. and and but you're laying down this wall like you don't need an octave you are you're three octaves three and octaves. And, <laughs> and and if you could talk about how you got into it why you got into it and and what made you pull that out and go this is me yeah how, how okay. did you pull that out of, out of your arsenal the 12th <laughs> let's let's go back to 76 when Cheap Trick put out the oh, he's going to say it. He said it. He you said, said it. it. Yep. <laughs> 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 I went, what the fuck is that? Because I'm looking <laughs> yep. for, I'm 27 years old. I'm still looking for tone. Yeah. You know, I'm still learning, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm hungry. And all of a sudden I hear this coming out of the speakers. And um, I just became a big fan. And even though I did not know it was a 12 string, until we went on tour with them, which was 25, wait, wait, 25, 20, 15 maybe years later when we got a record deal and we actually toured with Cheap Trick on our first record. And he walked out with this 12 string and I went, wow, so that's what you do. And one day I was standing right before they walked on stage to play and I'm standing there talking to Tom. And I said, dude, that 12 string is so cool. Uh, he said, you want to play it? And I'm going, well, I'm, left- <laughs> I- I'm, I'm left-handed. You know, he says, no, put it on. Just check it out. Now, mind you, the crowd is waiting for them to walk on stage. The music's playing. They're getting ready to be announced. And he hands me his bass and said, check this out. And I kind of plunked on it just with the volume turned off. And it felt like a beautiful 12-string guitar. Wow. And I remembered how 12-string acoustic guitars, just how, how the crystal beauty beauty of them. And I thought, wow. And he says, you should call up Hangover and get one. 
So wow. we, oh. we we uh, we got a hold of Hamer. Basically, they got a hold of time. It was the it. Hamer. It was wow. right because okay. he so, he eventually went to Guild. Yeah, but he's he, he. So what I learned was he, he designed him, that thing. Yes, him and Joe Vanzi. Yes, and and so when I joined up with them, they were ecstatic because I was pretty much the only other person who liked the twelve string, and they made me like five of them, and they were they were really really good basses. Mm. I had I had to sell them back in the day in, in the two thousands when we were all well, some of us were having little financial difficulty, and uh, and I know the guy that has them all. So if I ever want to get them back, he said he'd sell them to me, which yeah, is awesome. Tom Peterson talks about why he had this vision. <laughs> Like like you had a dream to play bass, and he had this dream to play a twelve string bass. Mm. And, I'm glad and, he had it. Yes, and so and, and so. Oh, go ahead. Oh, but he put like everything he had into talking to these guys, mm. and and coming up with the prototypes, and and he was investing in it with them. And yeah. I mean, it was just it was like he he didn't care if nobody else ever played it. It was his vision. Mm -hmm. It and, was. Uh, I, I know him. I love him. Um, we we only talked a couple times, and uh, he's just he's he's my hero, you know. And I always let him know. Uh -huh. <laughs> let me ask you this. I want to ask you about now singing and bass playing. We have Sting, Jack Bruce, Getty Lee from Rush, Sting from the Police, obviously mm -hmm. yourself, um, a couple of other players out there. I can't think of the names offhand. But the singing bass combination, what motivated you to want to do that? And the 40s, wow. how did this all come together? Wow. That's a, that's a long story, too, so I'll try to condense it. But I would like to interject about the 12-string. I have a Doug 12-string now. It's a signature 12-string from Sheffield. Oh, really? Okay. And, a lot, and lots of people are buying it. There's a few videos up where kids are, these young bass players are doing like this Jocko harmonic Billy Shee and stuff on really? 12 screen. Go, go, yeah, we go gotta look, look that up. up. There's, there's some kids out there just doing some creative stuff. There's a lot screen. of young talent. I mean, actually, I was talking about this with Greg recently. Mm -hmm. Greg was saying, oh, they're not, there's not a lot of these young kids. Like, oh, no, there's plenty of them mm -hmm. out there. They're anything, out there. And they're smoking. They're out they're yes. outgrowing, they're outgrowing the generation um, prior yes. to them. And mm -hmm. I use the basketball guys. analogy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you I, know, I, it, Sadly enough, though, too, is that the way they're going to make money in the new, the new norm is you keep putting out those TikTok videos, and yes. then advertisers come, and you just sit there and play, and that is, and you sit at home all day. You don't get to tour, you don't get to play with anybody. There's no but, socializing, right? But you see these little kids world. playing on the uh, on YouTube, yeah, and 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 they're all playing Sir Duke, and you know it's uh, and, and <laughs> I will you know, add to that. Actually, I will say that. I noticed that um, they are doing their the new version of the classifieds is YouTube. So mm -hmm. one kid will actually you'll have this bass player phenomenon, ten year old kid, and then you'll have some twelve year old female singer or singer, and then you'll have this drummer phenomenon, and then another guitar player, and then somehow they all mysteriously appear at Nam. With their older family members, and now, yeah, yep. and that's when you see them kind of gather. So you have video of them at Nam. Mm -hmm. Then you see six months to a year later, they're on tour in Europe. Wow, you know? yeah, yeah. So that that's the only thing I will add to it because I've been watching, I've been following a couple of people. There's a, this um, mm. family, Justin Schultz and his sister. They're signed to are uh, the signed to uh, oh, the Quincy kids Jones. got blonde blonde hair kid with the, so that's, the, that's Aaron, the Les that's, Paul hanging. No, that's I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. There's one okay. guy's got blonde hair, guitar player. Then and a girl just, plays drums. Drums, girls that play drums, but she's also an incredible bass player. Like she's the girl that plays drums, and then she's an incredible bass player. And then her brother, uh, yeah, it's so scary that the entire I call them multi instrumentalists. Yeah, yeah. Like, holy crap! The six string yeah. bass, five string bass. Mm -hmm. and They're all. It's amazing. It's all yeah. amazing. Yeah. So, but that's <laughs> the new digital version of it. Is that? Yeah, you know how it works. I, I always say too when um I watch all this stuff, I think, you know, all of us right here in in this chat room were those kids. We just didn't have parents who put everything in our face and we didn't have the internet to feed us. No, because no. All, all we needed mm -hmm. was we just needed to be fed. And we, there was nowhere to go. We're, you know, what'd you do? You had Circus Magazine, maybe. Yeah, uh, Circus Magazine. <laughs> right. 
Circus Magazine. <laughs> but anyway, uh, to singing and playing bass. I've always sang my whole life. Um, my mom says I was singing before I could talk. Now you, um, were, you were from a church, a church background? Um, you know, it, 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 it seems like it, but I don't want to say it was from a church background because everything I listened to, I drank up. You know, um, and the church background was when I moved in with my mom when I was 14. That's when the whole gospel music thing was happening. Edwin Hawkins singers was yep. doing their thing. Oh, happy and, day. And, yeah. you're right. And so all the churches had choirs and I would go watch these singers and all these singers, you know, they sound like they were on Motown, you know, I mean, all these great singers. And that's when, when I started learning to sing soulful. But before that, before that, I grew up with my grandmother, who was very religious. But the church we went to was like five or six people there, and you just sang hymns. So mm -hmm. I didn't, there, there was no singing there for me. Um, but what I did was, uh, I went with, uh, when I was in grade school and high school, the teacher, music teacher, always uh, knew that I could sing. So they always would make me sing in the choir. They'd make me sing in contests. And they always taught me music. And, and so, you know, all my life, there's always been somebody musical that's been hanging out with me, showing me things as mm -hmm. a child. Um, even in high school, it's the same thing. So I was always singing. And then when I started moving in with my mother, and I started listening to soul music more. And um, that, whole, that whole genre, James Brown and stuff. And I started to learn how to mimic it. That's why I always mm -hmm. go soul music. It's all learned. We have, we, everything we do, we learn it. And sure. so I, hon I honed in on it. I'm going, so what is it when you hit that note, somebody yells. And when you say that word, the other person screams, you know? And mm -hmm. that's what soul, soul music is, is in making your voice make people feel a certain word that you're saying. Soul music if, is an extension it, of the church. It's call and response. Right. And if call you and feel response. it, right, it's a call and response. You got to get down and let the people feel what you're saying. And uh, and it's all in the inflection, and it can be learned. And some is real, and some is fake, and you can we can always tell. Yeah, but anyway, mm -hmm. and uh, so so I always was I was singing, and so even when I first got in the rock band, I was I was uh, or, or a band. I was eighteen, I think, when we got in the band, and we did Sly and the Family Stone and stuff like that, and I was singing in that band. And um, one day, um, uh, years a few years later. I started um, my own band mm. uh, with my cousin, and he played drums. And this was like '75, okay. and we got a, we got another guitar player, and we were we were pretty primitive, but we did all this prog type stuff, like yes, and we wrote just these weird weird songs. And I was trying to be Chris Squire. And uh, where am I going with this? <laughs> I think everyone. Oh, wanted, oh. I think every bass everybody at one point tried to be at one point <laughs> tried to be Chris yeah. Squire or Getty uh, Lee. One of those okay. two. Okay. Or so well, for me, it was Verdine White, Lewis Johnson, Chris Squire, um, and go. Getty Lee. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So through that, you know, every band that I was always in, we never could. You know, they would always go, "You sing, Doug," and I'm going, "We we got to get a singer. I just want to play bass." And they'd always say, "Now you're gonna sing too." Um, I've always <laughs> been, I was always been made to sing in every band I was in ever. In wow, I've always been the singer, and and it, and so I just let it be. Um, well, let me ask. I gotta ask. I gotta, I gotta ask. I gotta ask. Go, ask what, go, go, when did you realize that you were a front guy? Um, that never occurred until I was God in my forties. Come on. I, um oh my god yeah um but before that um i just well here's the thing is you know uh oh well god even that okay and, and, if, and if you're not I, a I got front all this guy stuff. So, so, sorry there's so much no it's okay head, head right now because listen when you ask me questions i have four decades of stories to tell of mm -hmm. where i and so i gotta say you're talking about the front man okay front man when I was in my, I was about 26, I was in a band, I, my cousin was in the band and we are at that point, Jesus Freaks. So we went to this Jesus commune and we played for Jesus, you know? Mm. And, and, and in those songs, you, it, to be a Christian Jesus band back in the seventies, you had to preach or talk about Jesus and try to bring people to, to the Lord mm. and have an altar call, okay? so. I just would start talking in between songs because I was the one who was singing and playing bass. 
And, and so it just kind of turned into a habit. And then when I got into King's X, we got away. Well, I got away from the religious thing and we started just doing bars and doing clubs. And at clubs, you got to work the audience. So I just kept working the audience. And then we got to King's X. And well, what are you going to do? You keep on talking to the audience. And Ty and Jerry don't like to talk anyway from the mm -hmm. stage. So it's like, it's all whatever I say. And, um, and it just that, got that album was a game changer. The whole vibe was a game changer. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, just, just, I mean, I'd grow up listening to trios and four mm. piece, but basically yep. trios. Mm. And, and I mean, at the time I was listening to zebra, remember zebra, <laughs> Yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, and, I remember. And, but, but then King's X came across and it was like, this is different. This is, this is something on a gut a level. Lot more compared to Zebra. It, there was a lot more. It, um, it, it was, it wasn't so much that it was less commercial. It was more energy. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, think about the bass lines and like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, seriously. Uh, I'm just doing I'm just doing John Entwistle and Chris Squire, man. <laughs> I know, but just this, this you know, is how Anthony and I talk on the phone. We're, we're, honestly, <laughs> we're, we're, we're like high school teenagers. Like we're like these. We're like ah. So even when <laughs> we do a riff, just your riff, you're doing it, John Entwistle and um, Chris Squire, but on steroids. He was literally. Well, like, uh, he's he's doing it as his own though. It, yeah, it's I, his am, own. I am. I am their little brother. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Little yes. brothers always have to outdo the big brother. They're that's inspired. Right. I mean, that's what we are. You know, yeah, your, your idols become your rivals, and that's right. It. So when right. you put that stuff out, and I heard that when I was, I was in high school when I first heard Kings. Like, and I was like, oh. <laughs> damn right. And just I remember okay. hearing the riff, and I was like, oh, oh, oh awesome. my god! Like I wanted to fight. <laughs> it's like oh good. Cool. Well, I mean, but to, just from a listening perspective, is like who? What producer is going to put that on a record and put it out? considering you know you got to fight with all these other other acts and entities that are out there fighting for airplay or fans or you know i mean it, it, it's the biggest credit in the world you know that, that <laughs> people people absorb it and go out i mean look i i play i i had a heart transplant three years ago i played 45 shows this summer and, and i'm still doing my chris squire impersonation and, <laughs> you know and and all these other things yep. and and mm. you know it's it's it, it it it's a lot to be that guy who broke through you know with those in influences playing those riffs mm. and and we love it 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 it's serious what anthony and i talk about on the phone after you get off we'll talk three more hours about this mm. yep and and it'll be like oh my god the Chris Squire if and and I've been listening to I've been I've been listening to Starship Trooper and oh, Jack Cassidy yes That's right his bass tone them Fender uh, uh what is it Basman yeah yeah Fender Basman heads wide open yep the tone come on <laughs> yeah <laughs> seriously I lost it when I first heard Jefferson airplane I went what is this bass tone I'm going what how does yeah. he do that with that big old white bass he is yeah yep yep, yep. just so incredible this. now we're going to come to an end to our show because I have to tonight I'm working no I have so much more to talk about sorry I know well <laughs> if we can do it again we'd love to have we'd you love back. to do it again part, part two Yep, yep. Yeah, we'll have a part, part two. two. I I got to go try out in a band and play share music. So yes. tonight I'm working with uh, Darlene. <laughs> Darlene Love is doing her uh, Christmas special, so I'm I'm not playing bass, but I'm a video director for the theater. So we're going to be recording all the events. So, but awesome. what I want to ask is before we leave, so what would you tell an aspiring bass player who wants to get into the industry? Like, what would you say? <sighs> To who wants to get into the industry or play the bass and make it a professional career? Well, I mean, to 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 play bass and make it a professional career, I would only I can only tell them what I did, which is horrible advice. Honestly, was just start playing mm -hmm. and just be obsessed with it and just see where it goes, you know. And that is not a good approach in mm -hmm. some ways. You know, because, you know, it's like the, the, sper the, the, the sperm that swim to the egg, only one gets through. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, it's like, it's all about chance. You know, did you do the right things? But, but the truth of the matter is just, you know, just play the best you can. And, well, the biggest thing 
and you guys understand this, is a lot of bass players don't know what a groove is. <gasps> they don't know how oh, to man. stay. They he, don't know how to stay it. on that he, riff. He nailed it. Can, listen, I got to say one thing real quick, too. You got to learn how to play the same riff for 10 minutes and mm -hmm. take the band through three or four different emotions and rock the crowd at the same time without changing the lick. Yep. You can check, nice. you can play it harder, soft, I agree. staccato it. You could do whatever you want. And I've done this with, with a couple of jam bands. Mm -hmm. I would play one riff and I could bring us up and then down and make you want to beat the floor. All you do is just yep. follow the bass. The yeah. bass, the bass player rules the band, even though they won't admit it. You're right. It's all yeah, about the yeah. if the bass ain't driving, your shit ain't absolutely. Happening. It's yeah. not happening. And here in in Soundman, the same thing. Turn up the fucking bass. Yeah. We need we need we need to hear the low end with the guitar so they make sense. Absolutely. All these fucking scratchy guitars, these marshals. With yep. <laughs> you can't tell what they're doing. Oh. You put yeah. some bottom under it, you yep. know? Oh, man. Anyway. No, was the king of that. Come coach my running? band. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, listen to, you listen to a lot of Bad Brains material with Daryl Jennings. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did a gig in the at the Colony many years ago in Woodstock. I was playing with another band. Daryl Jennifer happened to be there with a couple of bands from his side project, Stealth. Daryl grabbed my bass and he made my bass these things that I never. <laughs> I was like, holy crap. And just a awesome. simple riff where he took, um, which I did not know that a lot of the bad brains, those, those riffs, they're mm -hmm. not the guitar player. I thought Dr. No told me once because that's, that's Daryl who created those, oh. those riffs. So cool. it's on Stealth. It's always a very slow start. And the drums mm. <laughs> just and I'm watching him going and I'm in awe. I didn't want to play the rest of the night after that. I was like, <laughs> I said my bass was on fire. And it's so funny how you can get you can take ten players, have your one bass, and get ten completely different sounds from it. Oh yeah. I mean, it was incredible. I promise you. <laughs> it's in the hands. It was, it it was, it was orgasmic it for me in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's time to say goodbye, unfortunately. But until next time. Doug, thanks for coming out, and, yeah, and we appreciate it. And uh, you're always welcome back. You're, you, you've, you're definitely an inspiration to, you know, bass players everywhere because you've, you've put it out. You've got the records. Um, they ask you to sit in when they're having jams and uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's just uh, every, every time I do one of these, these talks, I've, it, I've grown just just like mentally to to watch what i'm doing my notes that i'm playing mm. how i'm how i'm approaching all these things and i'm rising i'm rising right through my band and i i don't think they like it and i love it good i want to give, give you a final compliment you look awesome for your age dude i'm jealous of you <laughs> thank I, you my goal is to be i'm 56 yeah that's true you know i'm like my musk i mean look i gotta lose i gotta keep my weight low enough because my heart failure but oh, at the same yeah. time i'm looking at you going this guy looks awesome <laughs> you, got like, you, you got like kid skin. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, I, I'm lucky. It runs in the family. Yep.